just to begin, what initially seemed like a novel experience for some of us, so skipping the commute to the office and working from home, has evolved into weeks and months locked away in quarantine. And as each of us search for updates, news, and signs of hope, we become familiar with terms that were once reserved for epidemiologists and principal investigators. Concepts like bending the curve, serological testing, structural therapeutic design, and RNA vaccines. If the strategy of the Weizmann Institute since its founding was providing the scientists with the freedom, infrastructure, and creative outlets to tackle the most pressing scientific questions, the current crisis has really unleashed a flood of inspired, promising, and purposeful scientific collaboration in response to the heightened sense of urgency around this novel virus. In record time, we've watched the Institute do what it does best, collaborate, share, adapt, and doggedly pursue knowledge that will eventually vanquish this pathogen. And to describe some of this in more detail, we are joined by two scientists today from the Weizmann Institute who can detail for us some of these collaborations and the national and international leadership that the Weizmann Institute is playing right now, uh, you know, every day. Our main speaker will be Professor Sorel Fleischmann, the Professor of Biomolecular Sciences, and our other speaker will be the Vice President of the Institute, Professor Roe Ozeri, who's helping to lead and navigate the quickly evolving situation in Rehoboth. Uh, Professor Ozeri was born in Israel. He got his bachelor's of science degree in physics from the Hebrew University, and he received his master's and his PhD degree in physics from the Weizmann Institute of Science. He conducted his postdoctoral studies at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, in the group of David Wineland, who was the 2012 Physics Nobel Laureate. Uh, and he joined the Weizmann Institute faculty in 2007. I will uh, I'll let Roe make uh, some comments now. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, and thank you all for joining. Um, and I'd like to use this opportunity to thank all of you for being longtime supporters and friends of the Weizmann Institute of Science. I think for us, we're always full of gratitude um, for our friends and supporters, and especially times like this, it's, it, means, it means a lot to us. Um, you know, the situation, I don't have to, to tell you too much about the global situation. Um, it's not just an, of course, not just an Israeli episode, but all of us all around the world are under this uh, global epidemic, uh, pandemic. Um, we watch from here, we know that the situation on the East Coast of the U.S. Um, is dire and, and, you know, we're very concerned, of course. For us as well, that's the uh, fifth of the sixth week of almost complete lockdown under the uh, regulations that were issued by the Israeli Ministry of Health and the government, uh, which means that for us as an academic institution, uh, we had to lower the presence on campus to 15%. Uh, we had to send um, almost 70% of employees, not the students and the scientists, but the technical and administrative staff on paid leave, which means that the activity at the Weizmann Institute on the one hand had to be reduced uh, to a bare minimum. And the reasons for that are reasons of, of public health. In fact, uh, very early on, so beginning of March, we had to cancel on the call all the conferences on campus for obvious reasons. But now we're starting renewing conferences through digital means, through video conferencing. And the first conference that we're holding is a conference of those 40, 50 groups that are doing coronavirus research in order for people to exchange ideas um, and collaborate. Something else that happened um, due to the fact that science is now at the forefront of this uh, global fight against the pandemic that turned the media projector onto the, the Weizmann Institute. I think we're not, you know, in, we haven't been an institute that seeks media attention too much. In recent weeks, we've been clearly at the center of both national and international uh, media, news stories at the um, Israeli uh, TV uh, broadcasting stations, as well as all the uh, major newspapers, stories about research and tests performed at the Weizmann Institute um, are constantly 
showing up. Um, and there were recent stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal about, um, about research studies that were performed at the, at the Weizmann Institute as well. Luckily, the situation in Israel seems to be uh, slowly stabilizing. The number of new cases uh, every day are gradually going down. I think today we're roughly at the 200 new cases per day. Um, and this weekend, the government has decided to slowly reduce the means of lockdown, which means that now we're allowed 30% uh, of our employees on campus. So there's gradual increase, which allows us to open up facilities that up to now were closed, such as the biological services, uh, the chemistry facilities, all the, all the support facilities of science on campus. And we hope that this would really help us slowly go back into full research capacity. And we're all hopeful that, um, that the coronavirus situation uh, will slowly slow down and allow us to get back, maybe not to the full um, routine that we had uh, a couple of months ago, but to a form of routine that, that will help us function again, both at the personal level as well as uh, scientifically. Hope all of us share. So with that, I would like to introduce one of our um, front fire fighters against the coronavirus epidemic. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very proud of the Weizmann Institute of being an interdisciplinary research institute. We're very proud of the fact that our science is not categorized into hard-walled categories such as physics or, or math or, or biology or chemistry, and that our scientists are, are versed in multidisciplines of science. And I think Sarel is a great example of that. Sarel's research is at the interface of computer science, molecular biology, biophysics, biochemistry. Um, Sarel did his uh, bachelor's and his graduate school at the, at the University of Tel Aviv University. He did a postdoc at the University of Washington in Seattle. And since 2011, um, is a faculty member at the Weizmann Institute of Science. Sarel is an expert about taking proteins and stabilizing them and the path Sarel takes, and I'm sure he'll tell you about it uh, in his talk, starts at the in silicon chips, so Sarel uses computer or develops the computer programs that design these proteins and then he fabricates these proteins and tests them in the lab. And these proteins then can have uh, medicinal um, uh, capabilities. So for example, one of the big successes of Sarel in recent years was to design, test, and prove that a particular protein is stable enough uh, to serve as an excellent candidate for being a vaccine against malaria. Um, Sarel is now turning his innovative uh, powers into trying and design a vaccine that would work uh, against the coronavirus as well. I want to mention that uh, Sarel Fleischmann is also the director of the Dr. Barry Sherman Institute for Medicinal Chemistry. We have high hopes for uh, Sarel uh, as a fighter against the coronavirus. So please, Sarel. Thank you all for joining. Um, these are indeed uh, very, very uh, challenging times. So my lab, as we mentioned, works on, uh, develops computer programs to design better proteins. And we have a specific focus on antibodies, which are special molecules that our body produces to fight off uh, viral infections. In fact, when our body is first encounters uh, a new virus, it studies the virus uh, surface and tests a very wide array of different antibodies that the body produces in order to test which one of them can bind and block uh, the virus uh, infection. Once it finds such a, an antibody, it mass produces it to fight off this particular infection. And it also stores this antibody in what's known as immune memory, so that the next time we're faced with this specific virus, uh, the body can, again, mass produce this antibody, and we may not even get sick. Uh, so this is how our bodies fight off uh, uh, viruses. Uh, the key issue about this new coronavirus is that it is new. Uh, we, are not, uh, we haven't encountered it, and therefore uh, our bodies do not have immune memory uh, for this particular uh, virus. And that means that the whole process of studying the surface uh, and finding the correct antibody uh, needs to take place, and that can take weeks. And that's why uh, the, the disease can become so uh, severe. Uh, 
So there are very many uh, different uh, directions that science and technology are taking in order to fight off uh, this uh, pandemic. Um, and I'll just mention three, just very, very briefly, uh, that are relevant to this talk. One of them is obviously to develop a vaccine. This is a very long-term uh, effort. It may take as long as, you know, some people think maybe half a year, but it may take as long as a year and a half uh, to develop an effective uh, vaccine for uh, clinical uh, use. Obviously, once we have such a vaccine, we'll inoculate the entire population and therefore uh, provide uh, protective immunity. But not all people respond well to a vaccine. Some people don't develop uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, when vaccinated, and therefore we must have another uh, form of treatment, essentially a drug, uh, to fight off uh, this uh, infection. And therefore there are two other uh, different directions uh, that uh, research is now uh, taking. One is to isolate antibodies uh, from convalescent patients of coronavirus, uh, isolate these antibodies, find out which one of them is neutralizing uh, against this uh, infection, and then mass produce it and, and use it as a drug uh, to treat uh, the infection. This is ongoing and I think it's very promising. Uh, and the third direction is the direction that we're most focusing on, uh, is to develop completely new antibodies uh, that would uh, find vulnerabilities on the surface of the virus and block uh, infection. So. My lab um, is trying to help in all of these uh, three uh, efforts, and again, with a, a focus on the third of uh, designing completely new antibodies that would block uh, the coronavirus. So now I'll share my screen with you. So I named this um, uh, brief talk a progress report because um, this is very much, what I'll present today on the coronavirus is very much quite preliminary. Uh, we don't have conclusive uh, results uh, yet, and I'd like to stress this uh, at the start. We have ideas uh, which we're very hopeful uh, about, and, and we're really working very hard uh, to realize them. Um, so I guess many of you have seen these uh, very haunting, I guess, images of the coronavirus. Uh, this is uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, image here. Um, and you, see, you can see that the coronavirus is sort of circular and there are these protrusions on its surface. These protrusions are known as the spike protein. They're actually viral proteins on the surface uh, of the virus. Um, and they're the main, this, this spike protein is actually the main villain in the story of the coronavirus uh, infection because the spike protein enables the virus first to attach uh, to cells that lie in our lungs and then to insert into these uh, cells. So, of course, by blocking uh, this protein, the spike protein, we may be able to block infection. But these images are far too coarse, they're low resolution, and do not provide us with enough detail to uh, design uh, new antibodies to target uh, the spike protein. Two months ago, our collaborator at the University of Texas uh, solved the, or determined the atomic structure of this uh, spike protein, and you can see it here. Uh, so I mentioned that the coronavirus is new uh, to us, but it's not completely new. Uh, in 2003, you may remember there was the, the SARS uh, epidemic, um, and the SARS epidemic was caused by another coronavirus, not the coronavirus that currently um, is, uh, is prevalent, but a different coronavirus, and these viruses are quite similar to one another, and what this means is that we don't need to study the new coronavirus uh, from scratch, we can actually transfer the knowledge that was gathered over 15 years of excellent research on the SARS epidemic and learn from that uh, some of the vulnerabilities of this new coronavirus. And that research really very clearly outlines that there are vulnerabilities on the spike protein, and I labeled them here in yellow and pink. Uh, we know that attaching uh, to these sites uh, can block uh, the spike protein from infecting our cells. So if we could design proteins that would bind to these specific sites, we could block uh, infection. They, these could serve as potential therapeutics. So the key question becomes, can we design proteins that don't bind just anywhere uh, on this large uh, spike protein, but bind specifically to these very sites? So this is taken from work that I did as a postdoc 10 years ago at the University of Washington, as we uh, mentioned. Uh, during my postdoc, I was concerned with the question of could we design proteins to bind to other proteins? And we targeted uh, the hemagglutinin protein from the uh, flu pandemic that caused the Spanish flu uh, of 1918. So just as a reminder, this uh, pandemic was very, very serious. It caused the deaths of probably 50 or even more, 50 million people or even more around the world, uh, around uh, 1918, 1919. Uh, so similar to the coronavirus, uh, uh, influenza also has 
a protein that uh, is responsible for attaching and infecting uh, our, our cells. This is known as the hemagglutinin uh, protein. And we knew that, again, similar to the coronavirus spike protein, there is a vulnerability on this hemagglutinin protein. We knew that binding tightly uh, to this site can block uh, the functions of this protein and can therefore block uh, infectivity. So we use the methods that I developed in order to design proteins which uh, have this sort of fist-like shape uh, that bind to this region. And uh, this was the first example, in fact, we showed that these uh, proteins bound at atomic accuracy, they bound exactly as we designed them to bind, which was the first demonstration of its sort uh, that uh, computational protein design could actually target um, uh, biomedically relevant uh, proteins. And not only were these proteins accurate, they also blocked the infection in multiple flu strains, including the pandemic Spanish flu and ep epidemic uh, Asian uh, and swine flus, uh, which came later. Um, and actually, they were better blockers uh, than Tamiflu, which is commonly used as a treatment uh, against the flu. So this may sound like a case closed. Maybe now it's possible to use exactly the same method and transfer it to coronavirus spike protein, just generate new binders similar to this in order to target uh, the spike protein. But unfortunately, this is not the case. Uh, this method, even though it was uh, quite a breakthrough for computational protein design, the designs that came out of this method were somewhat compromised. They were not optimal. And it took years to optimize these proteins. For instance, they were not stable. They were not high affinity enough. It took years to optimize them to the point that they could actually provide protective um, protection against uh, influenza virus. And this is time that we simply don't have in a pandemic situation such as uh, this. So over the course of the eight years or so that have been at the Weizmann Institute, we've been developing a different computational design strategy in order to, to address uh, more reliably and more quickly uh, such uh, design challenges. So before I show you some examples that our design strategy actually works in some real world uh, cases, I'd like to give you a little bit of an intuition about what computational design generally means and what is special about our uh, approach. So in computational protein design, we start with an atomic structure, as I showed for the spike protein, for instance, an atomic structure of, of the protein. And we use a, phys uh, a physics-based strategy in order to design proteins to bind to that uh, uh, protein. What do I mean by physics-based? For instance, we represent each atom in the system uh, on the computer. And you can see some atoms would be, for instance, charged negatively. They have an electric negative charge shown in red. Others would have a positive charge shown in blue. So these would attract uh, one another, et cetera, et cetera. So we have uh, essentially uh, the computer can calculate very, very rapidly uh, uh, the stability of different constellations of atoms in the protein uh, system. So this sounds very nice. Uh, in principle, if this is rapid enough, we can go through billions and billions of different solutions and find the best one. But we and others have known for a very long time that such physics-based calculations on their own are not sufficiently accurate to design complex proteins such as antibodies. So the strategy that we developed, which is unique to our lab, uses, in addition to this physics-based information, also information derived from evolution. What do I mean by this? You can think about evolution as a sort of a billion year um, general e experiment done in nature on countless organisms in different environments. And what we can do is simply look at the surviving structures, the surviving proteins uh, that survived the evolutionary selection process and ask what are these structures that survived and in contrast, what are the structures that were left behind by evolution? They, they were selected out. And based on that, we can build a model uh, for what structures are beneficial and stable, whereas what the other structures are ju basically just junk and we should throw them away. So in a sense, our strategy is a hybrid. We use evolutionary data in order to guide the physics-based uh, calculations. So when we started off with this um, sort of hybrid uh, strategy, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know whether it would work. And if it does work, uh, to what extent? What would be uh, the scope of this uh, strategy? But what we found out over the past four years or so is that this hybrid strategy is actually very, very effective in dealing with very complex problems of protein engineering and design. And I'll show you just very brief, just two very brief examples for how this uh, hybrid strategy has helped us uh, deal with real world uh, protein engineering and design problems, starting with the question of stability. So um, 
proteins, many proteins. So we should think about proteins as being, you know, the most complex molecules on Earth. Uh, and often, many proteins are just simply not very stable. And this is a special problem when you're developing a vaccine, for instance, because vaccines need to be uh, um, produced in massive amounts. Um, and, and I'll show you one example for vaccine development from uh, malaria, which we looked at. Um, so malaria is still a very serious uh, disease. It's actually the most serious uh, parasitic uh, disease. It kills half a million people uh, every year, mostly young children in developing world uh, countries. Uh, and even though there has been over 60 years of research into developing a vaccine for malaria, this is considered a very serious problem and still there is no vaccine uh, for clinical uh, use. A few years ago, this protein called RH5 from the parasite that causes the malaria uh, disease uh, was um, characterized by our collaborators and shown to be a very promising candidate to serve as a vaccine because this protein is responsible for the process by which the parasite invades our red blood cells. And we know that the antibodies that block this protein can actually block malaria infectivity. So this sounds very exciting. Now we have a protein that can serve as a vaccine against malaria, but this protein, RH5, similar to many proteins from pathogens and especially from parasites, is notoriously unstable. It's very difficult to mass produce and it breaks down at temperatures as low as 40 uh, degrees Celsius. And why are these such terrible problems? Because if this protein ever reaches clinical stage, we would have to produce it in hundreds of millions of doses and ship it to some of the first countries in the world, for instance, in Central Africa, where there is no electricity and therefore no refrigeration. So to make this protein RH5 feasible as a, a potential malaria vaccine, we must make it much more cheaper, much cheaper, and also much more stable in terms of its uh, uh, temperature uh, stability. So we, we used our hybrid strategy, evolutionary-based um, atomistic design strategy, in order to design three variants uh, for this uh, RH5 uh, protein, and we recommended these variants to our collaborators at Oxford University. So these funny-looking blots, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background into biology, these funny-looking blots give you information about the levels of production of the protein in standard bacterial uh, cells. What this shows you here is that the natural protein RH5 can simply not be produced in, in standard bacterial cells, which means that the protein is very expensive uh, to mass produce. By contrast, all the three designs that we made are massively produced in standard bacterial cells. And already this result brings down the cost of production uh, for this key protein by about an order of magnitude. So this is uh, an important result in itself. Uh, furthermore, this design is also more stable by about 15 degrees Celsius. In fact, it's stable to the point of about 55 degrees Celsius, whereas, again, natural RH5 already breaks down at about 42 degrees Celsius. Our protein is stable beyond 50 degrees. So that means that it can be shipped uh, without refrigeration even to Africa. The most important question, of course, is, is it functional? Is it immunologically functional? So our collaborators at Oxford injected a natural RH5 in our design uh, to mice, isolated their antibodies, and tested whether these antibodies provide protective immunity. As you can see here, uh, the immunological profile for both the design and the natural uh, RH5 are completely identical, which means that the protein has lost nothing in its biological function. It's still an active, potentially an active uh, vaccine. And this was the first demonstration of its kind uh, for computational design to be able to very quickly, essentially in one shot, address a key uh, biomedical problem of how to mass produce cheaply and economically and also uh, how to stabilize uh, a key vaccine immune gene uh, for a very important disease such as uh, malaria. So this method is completely automated and we make it a very important principle for this lab uh, that any automated method should be very easy uh, for other people uh, to use. So we developed this method into a web server and over the past uh, three and a half years since launching this web server, you can see that essentially labs all over the world uh, have been using it. Uh, more than a thousand academic labs uh, have been using it daily, actually. Some of them have been using it uh, very often. Um, in the context of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, we see many labs that are using uh, the, our web servers in order to design better spike proteins, for instance, to use as a potential vaccine. And I'm very hopeful that our servers will actually help uh, in developing a cheap, economical, and fast uh, vaccine for uh, human uh, use in the future. 
So what I mentioned until now is how do we stabilize uh, therapeutic uh, proteins? Another key question is can we increase their activity? Now I'll show you some more recent work that we did on uh, a protein that can break down nerve agents. So nerve agents are these very complex chemicals uh, that are also very toxic. They're completely synthetic molecules that are produced by militaries and terrorist organizations, I guess. Um, and one drop on the skin of an adult, or for instance, VX or Soman or Serene, can kill within minutes. An adult can kill an adult uh, within minutes. So these are incredibly toxic compounds, and there is a lot of interest in, in finding a suitable countermeasure against these very toxic uh, compounds. PTE, this, uh, this is a natural uh, protein that can break these uh, compounds up, <clears throat> but it does so very, very slowly, too slowly for therapeutic use. So we asked whether the strategy that I mentioned at the beginning, this evolution-guided atomistic design strategy, could help us to design better variants of PTE that would be able to break down uh, these terrible uh, uh, toxic uh, compounds. So we designed a set of these uh, variants of this uh, PTE enzyme. And what this little bit complex uh, plot shows you is the improvement we observe uh, in, in different enzyme variants relative to the natural enzyme for these toxic compounds, including VX, serine, and soman. And you can appreciate this y-axis here is in log scale. So you can appreciate that some of these uh, designs improve the efficiency of this enzyme by from 100 to 4,000 fold relative to the natural enzyme. These two enzymes here actually provide uh, cross-neutralizing protection for all of the nerve agents we tested, including VX, Russian VX, Serene, and Soman. So these are actually at the therapeutic level, and they can be used as, as therapeutic, uh, ther therapeutics against uh, these toxic uh, nerve agents. So this, again, provided really unprecedented uh, demonstration that computational design could generate therapeutically relevant uh, enzymes, in this case, therapeutic proteins, uh, in one shot. We obtained these uh, enzymes within two or three months of starting the project, whereas it took more than a decade for other, um, uh, in other studies to optimize proteins to such uh, levels. So very, very quickly uh, to reach uh, therapeutic levels uh, um, in, in, in these uh, designs. And, and time is critical uh, in, these, uh, in these things, because especially in the pandemic situation, because all of the other conventional optimization strategies rely on iterative lab work, which takes months or years uh, to mature. Whereas now we have these, you know, essentially web servers that anybody can access and use in order to optimize uh, their favorite uh, proteins. So um, now I'd like to go back to the question with which we started uh, this uh, brief talk. Uh, can we design antibodies that would bind to these specific vulnerabilities under a new coronavirus uh, spike protein? So again, this is very, very preliminary. I don't yet have uh, data to show you that we have such uh, antibodies, but I want to share with you the strategy that we're using, which I think is quite promising, the strategy that we're using in order to tackle uh, this uh, problem. So as usual, we start on the computer. Uh, we start with uh, the viral protein. In this case, this would be the spike protein. And again, we're not interested in binding to just any surface on the spike protein. There's specific sites, vulnerabilities again, on the spike that we're interested in. And we're using our computational methods in order to dock and to design, essentially to sculpt, uh, the surfaces of the antibodies uh, to bind uh, to this surface. This is computationally very intense. It takes really um, tens of thousands of uh, hours on, on, on a computer cluster. Uh, but in the end of this process, we get, let's say, a few dozen uh, promising candidates, promising antibodies that have the proper computational uh, metrics, features uh, that encourage us that they may be able to bind uh, this uh, target site. But we don't stop there. The novelty of this method is that we're starting from each of these, we call them leads, and we start from each of these leads and design 100,000 different variants. You know, we're re-sculpting each of these leads uh, to develop 100,000 different variants, mutants of the leads. And in total, we're designing between a million and 10 million uh, different antibodies. And we're not keeping this just to the computer. We actually want to test them uh, experimentally. So now we take all of these million to 10 million different antibodies, and we have a method uh, to uh, generate all of these antibodies and screen them using uh, an experimental strategy known as high throughput um, uh, screening. And this high throughput screening enables us to test 
10 million different designed antibodies essentially within an hour. And we can get data on which of these antibodies bind most tightly to the uh, spike protein, and which of them is better, you know, it, doesn't, it just doesn't work. And that can help us to improve our methods and also to obtain high affinity uh, binders. So the coronavirus spike protein is incredibly challenging, but I'm happy to report that we did get a few um, uh, starting leads that seemed very promising. You can see just examples of them. You can see that they sort of hug uh, the vulnerabilities on the spike protein very tightly, and we're always happy to see such uh, proteins. These are just two of the two million uh, that we're testing in the lab currently. So you can imagine the scope of this project is quite large. And we, although we are optimistic about these two million uh, designed uh, antibodies, we're also realistic. And we know that this is a very challenging problem. We're applying these design methods now also on a very large scale. We have uh, obtained a donation from various, you know, from uh, um, the uh, supercomputer uh, in Switzerland and various companies in order to massively uh, produce many, many more such uh, designs. This is a good time to mention the very talented uh, group of people who are working on this project, uh, Die Goldenzweig, Ravit Netzer, Lukas Krauss, and Shai Hoch, who are really working day and night, literally, uh, on this uh, project. I'd like also to thank uh, my group and funding agencies um, and you for your attention. And just before we go into the uh, questions and answers uh, part of the talk, I'd like to make just one final comment. Um, and, you know, I've, I've seen, um, you know, news reports comparing the current coronavirus pandemic to the uh, Spanish flu pandemic with which I started this talk, which caused, again, 50 million deaths worldwide. Um, and that's, you know, that's very, very uh, scary. And although the numbers for coronavirus are indeed quite high, uh, we should be more, more optimistic than that. That's my sense, at least. Because science and technology are obviously in a much better position uh, today than they were in our grandparents' uh, day. Uh, we have, you know, well, what I showed you today could not have been done even, you know, five years ago. We didn't have these uh, techniques at all. And, you know, there are hundreds and thousands of labs uh, throughout the world, each of them with their own uh, new techniques, who are applying uh, their technologies uh, to this problem. Uh, so I'm optimistic that the solution would come uh, quite uh, soon. Another reason for optimism, in my view, again, uh, is that we see, since this pandemic started, we see something that resembles, uh, I would say, uh, very rapid, and in my view, a very positive revolution uh, in how science is done, uh, in how science addresses uh, such crises. In, in usual circumstances, uh, scientists work alone in small teams. Uh, they develop their methods, they get data, uh, they gather these data, and then they send these data in, uh, in, in publication to a specific journal. They wait for the journal to respond, and this process can take months and even years in some cases. What we're seeing with the corona pandemic is groups publishing even raw data on web servers, just for other people, for other groups, uh, to very rapidly uh, build on these results and thereby accelerate research. And we are seeing just very, very rapid um, uh, response to this uh, uh, coronavirus. And I, I think this is incredibly, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's both inspiring and also promising with respect to this uh, coronavirus pandemic. And maybe this is a good time to also think, you know, more broadly and for the long term, uh, that it, it is really these sorts of collaborations uh, that can solve massive problems of such global scale. And, you know, this pandemic is very serious, but it's not the last pandemic that humanity will face. And it's not the, only, it's not the, the most serious problem that we'll face in the future. There's still the climate change, there's, you know, other societal and economic challenges that we need to face. And if we face them together uh, through collaborative uh, technological, scientific and governmental efforts, I think we have a much better uh, chance of, of uh, favorably um, uh, solving them. So with that, I'll, I'll close and I'll answer any questions to the best of my ability. So the first one is, I've read that COVID-19 has mutated into many variants. Is it possible or even likely that the virus in New York City and Italy is, is a different variant than the one on the West Coast, say in Los Angeles? Um, it, this is a really good question. I think it's still an open question. I mean, it's very clear that the virus is mutating. Um, it's an open question whether these mutations are providing an adaptive benefit, whether these variants are better adapted to infect us or not. It's not clear at this point. So far, the um, the scientists I've talked to think that this is not the case, that the 
the mutations we observe in coronavirus are not substantial for its inf infectivity. Um, it's, it doesn't mean anything for the, going uh, into the future. And I should mention in this context, uh, influenza. So in the case of the flu, we had this uh, massive pandemic, the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. Um, after um, a, a, a huge amount of the population, a huge percentage of the human population became immune to the Spanish flu pandemic, the Spanish, th this uh, virus, the flu, acquired mutations. And these mutations enabled it to continue to infect human populations. But these mutations also debilitated the virus. It became from this massive very aggressive pandemic into what we now know as seasonal flu, a much less serious uh, disease. So these mutations, they may, be, uh, they may become uh, prevalent in the viral uh, populations, but they may also weaken uh, the virus in the future. Um, so, you know, it, it goes both ways. Uh, we shouldn't be so afraid of these uh, mutational processes, actually. Great, I'll move on to the next question. Are the antibodies specific to a person or specific to a type of virus? So can we be sure that an antibody derived from one person and used in another will work the same way in the second person as it did in the first person? A very good question. In, in general, the answer is yes. The, the antibodies would be specific for the virus and would behave nearly the same across the population. Why I say nearly the same? Because some antibodies can cause an immune reaction, so our bodies may treat them as foreign and therefore react to them, but this will take time. It doesn't, doesn't happen overnight, it actually may take months to happen. So in treating a, an acute disease such as a viral infection, this doesn't become a serious issue. Uh, but it's an important point. This is one of the reasons why Drug development is such a lengthy pro process because even when we find even a human antibody, which is considered to be state-of-the-art, gold standard safe, we still need to make sure that it is, it is indeed safe in a, in a, in a large uh, cohort of humans. That's excellent. So I'll do some follow-up questions, which I think are, are perfectly suited to where you ended with that. Does the introduction of synthetic antibodies interfere with the generation of naturally produced antibodies after the initial synthetic antibody treatment has been completed? Um, not that I know at all. Um, the antibodies would, um, would essentially exist in the system for as long as they're stable. Uh, and this can be from, you know, from a few hours to a few days, sometimes weeks. They're not there to stay. Um, so in, in one very, um, uh, attractive feature about antibodies in general, it, you know, some, some antibodies may behave differently, uh, but in general, antibodies are incredibly specific. They would bind to the uh, desired target and usually not to anything else. And again, there are safety concerns always. When you inject a massive amount of protein to a person, you first need to test it in animals and, and in, a, in a small group of uh, humans. You don't go uh, and deploy on a massive scale before making sure that it's safe. So in general, I would say the answer to this question is um, no, it's, it's, it's gonna be fine. It wouldn't interfere with the natural process of uh, our immune uh, reactions, um, but you, know, you have to test these things. So this is uh, again related to the synthetic antibodies. Given the neurological impact reported as a consequence of this virus, can these synthetic antibodies cross the blood-brain barrier to neutralize the virus directly in the central nervous system? Ooh, very, very uh, knowledgeable uh, question. <laughs> Um, yes, so there are some reports on the virus actually infecting uh, uh, the central nervous system, which is very worrying. Uh, usually the, uh, the disease happens within uh, the lungs more, uh, more typically, and that means that the, uh, the usual course of action with such an antibody is actually with an inhaler. You would inhale um, an aerosol containing the, such antibodies or other drug molecules, and they would protect your lungs. It's, it seems like, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in this, but it seems like these um, uh, central nervous system um, infections are due to very severe disease. So hopefully if we can uh, uh, get a hold of the disease in an earlier state, uh, we wouldn't need to cross the blood-brain barrier. Typically antibodies don't uh, cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, there are some modifications that may enable that, um, but generally speaking, this is not the case. They, they typically don't cross the blood-brain barrier. 
That's great. I think one, one question that's more clinically related, but I, I can ask you anyways, somebody's asking if there's anything that we can ingest or any nutrient that we can have that actually helps boost the human immunity response and creating more, uh, greater quantities of antibodies. Not that I know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question related to antibodies. Is the size of the dose of the antibody used in a person critical to eradicating and attacking the virus entirely? And then as a related question, is not the size of the dose, is the timing critical for the application of the treatment? Right, right, right. This is a very good question, both of them. Uh, the dose is, is critical because um, if, if the uh, viral load is large, you need a lot of uh, antibody, of course. Uh, there's also some questions about the kinetics of uh, blocking by antibodies. These are largely questions that we cannot address theoretically. They need to be done experimentally. Uh, and this is, again, one of the reasons why it takes time to develop a drug. Even you know, having a very promising uh, candidate in the lab, uh, we still need to know what dose to use uh, in a real world uh, situation. The second question was about, I'm sorry, this was? It was related to the time, so the timing. I'm Yes, uh, that's also a very, very good uh, question. Some drugs can be, can be given as a prophylactic, uh, meaning imagine um, nurses and doctors working in a highly contaminated uh, area. Uh, you want to protect them as much as possible. If they could take an, an inhaler, uh, for instance, to protect their lungs as they're uh, treating patients, that would be absolutely fantastic. So there's a question of what is the therapeutic window? And again, you cannot address these questions theoretically, you have to test. Um, it would be ideal if you could provide such a drug uh, prophylactically. And then the question is, after infection, how many days post-infection, can you still uh, get the therapeutic uh, response? Again, this is not uh, a question for theory. It's something that we need to address experimentally uh, by actual testing. Very good questions. Um, this is related to that note of optimism that you spoke about in the scientific community really uh, coming together at a moment of crisis. Do you think that this more open kind of collaboration will continue or do you think that there'll be a reversion after the crisis has passed back to the lone scientist in competition model? Again, a, a really great question. I'm I'm hopeful. I'll, I'll explain. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't um, uh, be too critical uh, of how science is typically done. The reason why scientists take so much time uh, to publish uh, their work is because they're careful. Uh, we want our scientific papers uh, or work to be, you know, not here for just a few months and then uh, be uh, uh, shown to be uh, wrong. We want them to have staying power for months or years or hopefully even longer uh, than that. So typically scientists are careful because they want uh, their scientific results to be uh, robust. Um, so in, I, th I think when we uh, end this emergency, I think a lot of science will go back to being done more carefully over longer periods of time, and that's just perfectly fine. I think though that we need to think about how do we address future crises? Uh, as scientists and as technologists. And in that case, we want to break down barriers as quickly as possible. And, and we want to make sure that there are these forums for exchanging ideas, uh, talking to one another uh, as quickly as possible um, in, in times of crisis. I, th I think it's more a solution to, to this uh, than to a general you know, science as a whole. So uh, another question, does the spike protein mutate and if it does, would the antibodies that are being designed still be effective? Excellent, yes. So th this was really the first question on this talk was how the virus mutates. And in fact, what we know is that mutations are happening on the spike protein. Um, and yes, uh, this is key because what this means is that antibodies that target um, regions that are mutated have a very high chance of simply not working in the future. Um, the sites that I showed you as vulnerabilities are actually highly conserved. What does that mean? Why are they vulnerabilities? The virus absolutely needs them in order to infect our lung cells. And that means that these sites are conserved, not just in this coronavirus, um, but also in the SARS 
uh, virus. The, the, the virus that caused the SARS uh, epidemic of 2003. Um, and this is the reason why we're targeting these sites specifically, because we think, you know, there's no assurance in these things, but we think that uh, the virus will, will have a hard time uh, mutating these sites without losing its ability to infect us. So one, one question that somebody sent in is, you know, how, how do we account for the virus presenting totally different symptoms in different individuals? Some people, it can be completely asymptomatic and other people can you know, develop, uh, you know, life-threatening uh, life pneumonia from it. Any, any kind of insight into that? Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an open question. I think many, many people are studying this. There are some, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert, but what I've heard, uh, for instance, is that, you know, there's, there's obviously a demographic uh, issue here. Um, older people uh, get more seriously ill, typically. Um, one of the reasons that I heard about this is that the lungs may have become uh, weaker uh, with age, uh, but we don't yet have an answer. This is, you know, we have uh, had this uh, virus for only uh, a few months. There are still no good animal models uh, to study uh, this, uh, this virus uh, in, in the lab. People are working actually uh, very hard on developing animal models for this. Many of these questions really need long-term uh, research, and, and this is research is being done right now. It's, it's, these are excellent questions. We need to know the answers to these questions. I like this last this one somebody sent in. Is folding at home still a useful tool for developing molecules for your effort? You might want to explain to people what that is. <laughs> um, Yes, so uh, there's uh, folding at home and there's actually Rosetta at home, which is a little bit more uh, relevant uh, to this question. Uh, these are what's called peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, servers. Uh, people are donating their computational, their computer resources. You can donate uh, your um, computer at home, your Xbox, or you know whatever you have uh, to these servers. And when, when you're not using the computer, uh, the computer gets information from a centrally located uh, server on how to run some simulations and proteins. Um, some of these simulations have to do with actually designing proteins. Um, we're not using these servers, again, as I mentioned uh, a little bit before, we're using a supercomputer uh, that was donated to us uh, by a very large uh, Swiss group at EPFL. We're also using uh, Amazon Web Services, which were very generous in providing us access to their computational resources. This again shows you this sort of generosity uh, that we see, not just in science, but also in technology. People are, are really, uh, they've heard about our research and, and they are, um, they've approached us to see if they can help. And, and this is, you know, it's, it's again inspiring. Somebody asked a question about a, a uh, product, a word I think none of us would have ever heard of if it wasn't for this, which is remdesivir. Yeah. <laughs> uh, your thoughts on it as a treatment and its mechanism of action was what they were asking about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good. I, I don't know enough. Uh, Remste this drug I can't even pronounce its, uh, its name. <laughs> um, is a general antiviral, um, and it's being tested uh, right now. Um, I think, you know, taking off-the-shelf drugs has a huge potential, uh, but we have to treat these uh, very carefully. You know, chloroquine uh, became uh, very prominent in the news a few weeks ago, but it was very clear from the start that the therapeutic uh, window for that was iffy at best, and, and now some results came from Brazil showing that it was a complete mess, uh, and that people should definitely not use it. Um, so again, each one of these uh, drugs must be studied very carefully. I know that there's a lot, of course, there's a lot of work in China uh, right now. Uh, there's also amazing work being done in Italy. Uh, doctors are really literally pulling stuff off the shelf and, and trying to treat uh, their very difficult and challenging uh, patients. And I've already seen, again, slides, you know, again, people are not waiting uh, to have data for papers. They're just sharing slides of data from hospitals and it's it's just amazing to see um so yeah another reason for optimism is that we do have uh, our shelves are highly stocked so i'll make this the last question because there, there are a lot of others but you know if if you were going to try to predict what is the probability that in a secondary wave of covid infection the virus will present differently yes okay so i think it's an open question, and I, I think making predictions on uh, exponential processes is, is very, uh, I, I won't go that way. Uh, but one thing that I can say, just as a 
comparison to influenza, which again serves us as a sort of a reference uh, in this very serious uh, situation, influenza is known to undergo relatively fast uh, mutation. Uh, but there are reasons why influenza is more mutagenic uh, than the current coronavirus. I won't go into the details of this, it's a little bit technical about how the genome, the viral genome is organized. But the viral genome is organized in influenza in such a way that enables it to undergo very fast mutation, whereas in coronavirus, it's not the case. And that gives, you know, again, the experts uh, reason for optimism that we won't see we, maybe, we may not see something like seasonal coronavirus. Maybe this won't be as serious as how influenza has been manifesting itself in human populations. But, you know, again, I, I'm not going to make a prediction on this. Great. So I want to thank everyone for participating today and really great questions. Uh, on behalf of all of us who participated, Sorel, Roe, thank you guys. I want to, you know, on behalf of all of us, thank all the scientists, all of your students that are doing such amazing work combating this global epidemic at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, I just wanted to say that I find myself recharged and feeling a little bit more optimistic and hopeful after each one of these webinars. So thank you so much for giving us a, a glimmer of hope here. And on behalf of the American Committee, uh, our network of supporters and donors, we're really proud to be able to help you guys get the resources and, uh, that you need in order to pursue these really interesting scientific possibilities. Uh, to that end, I just want to remind everyone that we've announced a global fundraising drive to reach $25 million for research related to the novel, the novel coronavirus that's happening right now, and we're raising money that was uh, th really throughout the world. I want to thank many of you who are on this call for generously supporting that effort and contributing. I'm proud to announce that we've already raised millions of dollars since the beginning of the initiative. And for those of you who are still considering or would like to get involved, I encourage all of you to either reach out to your local Aquis professional, or you can just send me an email. I hope all of you are safe and healthy and look forward to the next time we can all physically be together.